book of Romans. Um, we'll continue looking at this book of Romans, this book that has changed the world, this book that has, some theologians have called it the, the summit of the Bible. This, some theologians have called it that inside the book of Romans, we have every other doctrine is explained properly. And so today we're going to continue in Romans chapter 6. Um, but before we continue, I want to just remind you at home, um, wherever you're watching, you know, um, maybe you log in later to look at this. I want to remind you of how we started this journey and some key things that um, Brafalu was sharing with us by the Spirit that we should be as Berean Christians. Let us not just go through this series as just another series, but let this series go through us. Amen. Amen. Let it be a study that we have proposed in our heart to, to accept the teaching of the word of God and to make progressive changes in our lives. Amen. One of the things that a lot of people that are close to me know, I, I, I believe in practical Christianity. I don't, I, don't, I don't indulge imaginations that don't produce Christ. I don't, I don't listen to people that just want to talk about the concept that they don't want to touch the reality. It is important. There's a difference between concept and reality. You can conceptualize it to bring ideas. But when will those ideas manifest? And we know that faith is now. Everybody say faith is now. Faith is now. We ought to be living and manifesting Christ now. It's not a futuristic thing. Oh, when is shark? No, no, no. Now. What, are, what should we be doing now that refills Christ daily? So I want to encourage us. Please go back. We are now in chapter 6. I don't know where you dropped off the boat or where you checked out. <laughs> but get back on the bus. Amen. <laughs> get back on the bus. And let's, let's continue this journey together. Praise the Lord. In our last teaching... Um, but a robot was sharing with us from Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, we saw that the, 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 the concept or the teaching of grace was introduced. One of the things that you find in the book of Romans as we begin this morning, I just want to just summarize some, some themes that I have seen in the book of Romans. So you see between Romans 1 to 3, Paul was began to talk about condemnation. And then when we roll into Romans chapter 4, I think it was Brian Ladi that was teaching with us then, was talking about justification by faith. That we do not walk this and it is imputed into us. Praise the Lord. And in chapter 5, we started, Paul was talking to us about grace. He started telling us about grace. And Brother Robert was sharing with us by the Spirit and leading us into that scripture. And so I want to encourage you, go back and let's review these things again as Berean Christians because it's precept upon precept line upon line. Praise the Lord. And today we're going to roll into Romans chapter 6. And we begin to see that Paul is going to be introducing something about sanctification. Amen. And today, if I, I was writing a title for this, I call it Sanctification in Christ We Overcome. Amen. And so let's go to Romans chapter 1, and uh, Romans chapter 6 from verse 1. Remember that in verse 5, in chapter 5, there was, a, there was a understanding and a concept of grace. And so in, in, um, in chapter 6 and from verse 1, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So you see, he started Romans 6 with a problem. Like, okay, wait a minute. So after now that we know this grace thing, right? There's this thing called grace that God has given to us. Does it not justify sin? You know, it started with a problem. Are we saying that, okay, now that I'm saved, I can sin. And now that I'm saved, I can't lose my salvation. Paul was trying to challenge a conclusion that people might live with when you look, understand grace. And was challenging that problem. No, God forbid. So you look at us. He says, certainly not. And another translation will say, God forbid. How shall we, who is dead to sin, in verse 2 now, we're now in Romans 6, 2, live, live, live any longer in it. In other words, God forbid. How shall we, who are dead to sin, live any longer in it? 
So he's, he's letting you know that, no, 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 no. Grace does not permit sin. Grace is not a license for sin. Christ is not the minister of sin. <laughs> because some people, you know, at some point in, in the Christian work, there's some people that start selling certificate that once you have this certificate, you are going to heaven. Don't worry about it. Go do anything you want. <laughs> and they start seeing them drunk and doing all manner of things. And Luther said, wait a minute. This is not looking right. Christianity is not, and I think Sister Margaret and Brafalo said something yesterday that I, I, I tried to write down. Now, Christianity is the outward living of the indwelling Christ. Is the outward living of the indwelling Christ. So it's, it, we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Then we should walk in the light. Praise the Lord. Let's go on. So, so now Paul is challenging this and said, God forbid, how shall we that is dead to sin? So in other words, if I'm dead to sin as is, according to the revelation of grace, I'm, and according to my salvation, I am dead to sin. How can I then, saying that I'm dead to sin, live in sin? And he said, or do you not know? Now look at verse 3. So he began to under, reveal to us the, the meaning of death to sin. How did we die to sin? What happened to us that made us say that we are dead to sin? And look at that in, in verse 3. He said, know ye not that so many of us who were baptized in, into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? He's now bringing in, explaining to us that because we're baptized, according to the baptism, which we will see in Colossians 2, if you I, because I don't have time here, and I said we are Berean Christians, go check Colossians 2. You will find that, that Paul was also introducing, this, he was explaining that because of this baptism, we have been baptized into his death. And at the same, so in other words, now we are dead in Christ. We, are, we were dead with him. And now that we are raised back together, we are raised together with him. Praise the Lord. So the solution the solution to this is in Christ. Amen. In other words, when we are in Christ, we are dead to sin. Amen. Make sense? Amen. So, so let's go on. And said, so therefore, in verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That Jesus as Christ was raised from the dead from, by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. We walk in the newness of life. Christians, if we really have given our life to Jesus, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, the word united, I wanted to underline the word united. In some translations, it says, it says it, it, the, the, the word united is from an original word that means grafted in. If we have been grafted, if you have been grafted. If your salvation is real, if you have really become a partaker of the body of Christ, then we have been grafted in. And if we have been grafted in, therefore, when he died, we died with him. When he rose again, we rose again with him, right? And then Paul went further, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. 
that we should no longer be what? Slave to sin. Praise the Lord. He said, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we shall not serve sin. This is KJV. Tony, do you have New King James Version? That's what I use here. Yeah. So it says, we shall no longer be what? Slave to sin. And if you see the way Paul writes, Paul will say some statement and then later come up, kind of let you know that, you know what, I, I, I could not find another way to explain this, but I'm going to just say as a foolish man, like, you know, so he's not using a concept here that you are no longer slave to sin. Praise the Lord. The reason why this is important is that it helps us to begin to know what is going on within us. When we give our life to Jesus, we have the spirit, soul, and body, right? A lot of times we've heard that, right? So the spirit, soul, and body. Salvation, our salvation is progressive in nature. That's why you hear things that say something like we are saved. We, we, we have been saved. <laughs> okay, so let me say it this way. I am saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. Make sense? So... What does that progression mean? It means that there's a progression in our salvation, right? So we are saved. You know, we are saved from the penalty of sin. And then we are being saved from the power of sin. And then we will be saved from the presence of sin. Does that make sense? And I will, I will continue to come back to this concept of save, salvation, right? So that we understand that we are saved. We are saved from the penalty of sin. And we are being saved from the power of sin. And that is why you see a believer, someone that has received Christ, can still be tempted, can still fall into sin because there is a power that is drawing him to, come, to get into that space. But we are being saved from that power. Praise the Lord. And that's why Paul is now saying that don't be a slave to sin. Praise the Lord. He said in verse 7, and verse 7 just explains something that changes our relationship with sin. He said that, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So if, if we are dead, then you are free from sin. The only way you are free from sin completely is when you are dead, dead. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I had a, a theologian, um, I think it was in a seminary school, that it, I think it was in his 70s or something like that. And then when he wanted to pray, he was praying that God should, you know, deliver him from lust and all that, right? And then one of the students went back to him that, sir, I, I, are, you, are you battling with... <laughs> <laughs> Is there not a time that somebody will overcome loss completely? <laughs> and, the, and the professor told him that, well, definitely not at the age of 70. <laughs> In other words, because we will struggle. So the, we, we need to understand this concept so that we don't just fall into a mindset of, oh, you know what? I'm free. You know, Brother Falu told me something a long time ago. He said, the thought of you thinking that you cannot fall into sin the thought itself reveals to you that you can. The fact that you feel like this can never, this is, oh, is it, a setup. Praise the Lord. So there is a struggle. Even though we have been freed, now we are free from sin, but we are being free from the power of sin. We have been free from the penalty of sin. Now we are being free from the power of sin. And this requires us working together with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we'll get down there, but let's, let's continue. So, so we see here that our relationship, our relationship with sin nature changes. Before we were subject to it, now we are no longer subject. He said we should no longer be slave to sin. Because in Christ, we were dead with him, and now we've been risen together with him. And that he has risen together, he is no longer dead. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
He said, if, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 8. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. So you see that our, our access point to this revelation, to this restoration, to this new estate is in Christ. You see that Paul was tying everything to the fact that if we believe that we died with him in Christ, and that same Christ is risen and death has no dominion over him. Therefore, because of that relationship, we are no longer subject to sin. Amen. Make sense? So when we, fall, when we stay in Christ, we overcome sin. Amen. Amen. Because now Christ has risen and he dies no more. Sin has no power over him no more. In verse 9, he said, death no longer has power over him because he has risen. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. And the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise. See, this is the beauty of Paul, right? Paul, will, Paul this, this is why I've heard ministers who say you interpret scripture with scripture. Paul's writing was always revealing scripture with scripture. It wasn't a mind, it wasn't a concept, one dream or imagination. No. This is what the Bible says, and this is what it says, and this is the meaning thereof. That's what Paul does. So he's not just coming up with self-interpretation. You know what I mean? Like, hey, okay, I'm just thinking that it's not. No, 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 no. He will lay its scripture upon scripture. He said, likewise. Now, in other words, now, based on this, this revelation, you also reckon. Underline the word reckon. Because it's very important. Another translation says consider. That is the power of meditation. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin and be alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The solution was in Christ Jesus. So you don't combat sin. You don't combat sin with your own principles. If you look at the, 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 the way we have dealt with sin in past, in, you know, they'll say, don't do this, or don't do this, and then there was a time in the church, they'll say, oh, sisters should not wear trousers and um, or pants, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and, and brothers should, should sit on one side and let the sisters sit on one side. Everything is just to kind of avoid this thing called sin. <laughs> Everybody comes up, you know what, just cover your hair, make no hair rings, so that you don't look too pretty, because when you look pretty, there's... Everybody just looking at you and something is drawing them. <laughs> they, they, they were coming up with different concepts to deal with sin. Like, okay, let the brother sit on this side and let's keep the gap. Don't look here, brother. Keep your eyes focused. <laughs> Stop lusting. <laughs> they were doing all manner of things to make sure that let's deal with this sin thing. Yeah, but the sin nature is in man. That is the struggle. So when we give our life to Christ, I was saying earlier... We have overcome to a measure, but we are overcoming. Amen. Praise the Lord. We, are, we have overcome and we are overcoming. And so we see here that it says reckon. I want you to, the reason why I want to stay on this subject of reckon is because a lot of times people don't reckon. They don't consider the scriptures. They don't look for the solution. What does the Bible say about this matter? You are still struggling in in, in pornography, you are still struggling in lying, you are still struggling and in anger, in foolishness, and you have not considered what your inheritance is in Christ. You need to go back and consider it. Amen. Consider, reckon yourself to, the, to be dead indeed to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's take action against sin. That's what Paul was trying to get us to here. We have to what? Take action against sin. I heard something and I wrote it down. Um, as Christians, we are not sinless. We sin less. Make sense? You like that? <laughs> as, as believers, as born-again Christians, <laughs> We are not sinless. <laughs> we sin less. 
And so the, the hope is that the sin activities that we get into continues to diminish as we increase in him. Make sense? Because mortality is still subject to sin. It's still under the power of sin. But a time is coming when immortality will swallow up mortality. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. And that's why you see, <laughs> this Bible is beautiful. You know, the more you look into this, thing, you are just excited. He said, he that began a good work in me is able to finish it. We are work in progress, brethren. Amen. But we must, we must know that we are in a battle, praise the Lord, against this sin nature that tries to hold us down. Amen. Amen. So Paul was telling us here that let us reckon ourselves and say, therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. You see that? Don't let it. You don't let it. You know, my pastor, your pastor is not going to deliver you in this one. You don't let it. You cannot allow it. Knowing what you now know, don't let it. Make sense? Knowing what you now know, that is what happens to you when, you, when somebody will send you a text. And you have started composing the text. I'm going to give you my heart. <laughs> and there's something. Something will just rise up in you. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> 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 uh, you know those days when they had those bands? What would Jesus do? <laughs> you start pulling the band. <laughs> I wish I didn't have this band. <laughs> like... <laughs> Don't let sin, don't allow sin to reign. Now that you know what you now know, now that you know that Jesus has set you free from the power of sin, don't let sin reign over you. Don't allow it. You have to refuse it. You have to take that responsibility. That's the, and this, this is going to help us to know how to balance grace. Grace is a merited favor, they say, right? But what was merited? I know I liked going down there, but my time is... Think about it. You didn't work for it, so it was given to you. But what was given to you? The power of the Holy Spirit. You didn't need to work for the power of the Holy Spirit. But the power was given to you. You didn't work for it. So how it was given to you is unmerited. But what was given, you must use it. Praise the Lord. We must use the power of the Holy Spirit to destroy the sin nature. Sometimes when I'm getting angry, I just start speaking in tongues. One day I was in the office and Carol saw me speaking in tongues and praying. She said, if I only know what you are praying about, I can help you to pray. I said, you don't need to know. <laughs> because I'm overcoming the something. Something is... <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Even in the house, sometimes I'm walking in the house and I'm praying in the spirit. Because you mortify the deeds of the flesh. By the power of the Holy Ghost. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will not be subject to it. Praise the Lord. So let's move on. He said, and do not let, do not present your members as instrument of unrighteousness to sin. It's telling you, don't do it. You don't do it. Amen. He said, but present yourself to God as a living as being alive from the dead, and your members as instrument of what? Righteousness to God. Hallelujah. For sin shall not have dominion over me. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Praise the Lord. And I told you earlier, being under grace... To be under grace is to be under the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not a license of, oh, I have grace. You have grace and you are cursing, something is off. You have grace and you are lying and cheating and stealing, something is off. 
you are still allowing yourself to be subject to the power of sin. He said, but sin shall not have dominion over me. Praise the Lord. Let's go quickly to Galatians. Yes, thank you. We're going to fix that now. He said, so what does under the grace mean, right? And I'm running out of time, but let's go. Can you go to Galatians 5 for me? Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Um, okay, so let's look at Galatians 5 on verse 16. Then I say, walk in the spirit. And what? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the flesh, for the, for the flesh lust against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, what did he say now? Can we read that verse 18, please? But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So to be not under the law means to be led by the spirit. Because the spirit teaches us to obey. Amen. And we'll get into that next week. Praise the Lord. I said, now let's, let's see this thing we call flesh. Now the works of flesh are evidence. Which are what? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Are you seeing that? Hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath. I don't know who among us here have, have overcome all this list. You can check off, you know what, adultery, I, I got that. That's not done. But what about outburst of wrath? Selfishness, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, reverie, and the likes. You see, it begins to show us the things that this, this mortal nature, this, this carnality can produce in us. But he said, we shall what? We shall not have, he shall not have dominion over us. Praise the Lord. So, I want to encourage us today. What are the things that we need to do to overcome this, right? He said, and he said, I, which I've told you beforehand, just as also told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not what? Inherit the kingdom. But this fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. You know, this is where, if I was a lawyer, I'd say, I rest my case. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So Paul is showing us this thing we call the sin nature. This, this thing that we are struggling with. But we should not let it have dominion over us. Praise the Lord. And some of the things that we need to do, I always say this, you know, like for me, practically, what can you be doing to, to overcome this, to not continue? Are there things that we can do that can help us? Are there things that we can put in place that can allow us to overcome and to continue to increase in Christ? Yes. You know, and I'll mention some scriptures briefly. And... Um, you know, in First Thessalonians, I think he said, he said in Second Timothy two twenty two, Second Timothy two twenty two, he said you should flee. Can we go there, Tony? I know I didn't give you the scriptures, but twenty two, yes. He said we should flee. He said flee youthful lust, but what? Pursue. Pursue. Thank you, sir. He said you you run after righteousness, pursue righteousness. Faith, love, peace with those on the... Hello, I want to show something here. Did you see the word wit? You see the word peace, wit? There's power in a fellowship. You're not just the only one doing it. With those who call on the Lord, heart of a pure heart. So we overcome together. Praise the Lord. So you can, and, and, and Tony knows this, I said it a lot, like, you have to be selective about your, your community. If we don't play together, if we don't pray together, we don't play together. 
It's just my personal. It's not a, I don't, it's my own personal secret card. And I'm examining my relationship. This one, have we been, we play together, but do we pray together? I keep him on one side so that the counsel that comes from that channel <laughs> is subject to investigation. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So let's go to run through some few things here. We have to overcome. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Taking the shield of faith. That's some things that, some weapons that we use to overcome this thing. He said, and if you see in Ephesians chapter 6, right? Ephesians 6, he said, there's that. I'll just write this down because of time. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. This is talking about fighting the good fight of faith. Taking the shield of faith. Because there are darts every day. You turn on your TV. You go on the internet. The enemy is there with an arrow. Just click on that link. Boom. He's sending it your way. You begin to conjure evil. <laughs> I'm being practical here. You know, Brafalu knows me, right? When this political thing was going on, so many times I'll call Brafalu. My soul is in a mess, Brafalu. Help me out. Help me straighten it out. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll tell me, relax, stop, stop worrying, stop creating. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm being practical here. The dots are there, they're just waiting for you. You get into Walmart, somebody slammed the door on you, and you're like, what is going on? And then your brain starts so taking the shield of faith by which you what? Quench every dart. Praying always is another strategy. We must learn to pray always. Jesus told Peter, I have prayed for you. Luke 22, 31 to, 31 to 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has hacks to sift you. Luke 22, 31 to 32. I, I'm talking about praying always. We must learn to pray always. And Jesus was telling Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has hacks to sift, has hacks to sift you. Oh, I'm, I'm Okay. You get it, right? To, uh, to shift you as we. But I have pleaded in, in prayer for you. So he's praying for you that your faith should not fail. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we must learn to pray always. The other one is called, I, I write fasting. This helps you to humble yourself, right? Fasting. Isaiah 58 and verse 6. It said, is this not the fast that I've chosen to lose the bound of wickedness, to undo the heavy burden? To let your prayers go free, that you break every yoke. Praise the Lord. This talks about breaking the yokes. There are some natures that we have acquired in the past, and it's difficult to set free. You might you will be able to overcome it with fasting. Peter uh, Paul also said he said in fasting often. What was he fasting about? Because there are things that are always challenging him. He said, I've been in Perry with false brethren, with false teachers. You know, so sometimes Paul too was struggling in certain things that he felt like giving it to them. But when he's fasting, <laughs> he had to learn obedience. Amen. Praise the Lord. Another thing I wrote there is called fellowship. Fellowship for growth and accountability. So many times we talk about fellowship, right? We talk about fellowship and so many times people don't pay attention to it. They just feel fellowship is just for us to come together and clap hands and sing song and all that. No, but in fellowship, God creates a, a room for us to grow and also creates accountability. Praise the Lord. There are certain things that if I do, Tony will call me out on it or David will call me out on it. So say, hey, Larry, what is that? That doesn't sound like a Christian. That doesn't sound like a believer. In fellowship, there's accountability that must be built. Praise the Lord. It gives room. And that's, you can find that in 1 John 1, 5 to 10. 1 John 1, 5 to 10. Another very important one that I love here is also in that same 1 John 5, 1 to 10, is the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that, and the blood, it said, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 5 to 10. 1 John 1, 5 to 10. In that same passage that you see, you see that it talks about fellowship. We should have fellowship with him. You know, it talks about the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, you know what? Let me read it and then we'll close from there. Praise the Lord. Let's go there. 1 John chapter 1 from verse 5 to 10. So this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 
if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. So our fellowship reveals who we are fellowshipping with, right? And we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and what? Just to forgive us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I wrote down the cleanse confession from sin. So we see in this scripture, we see fellowship. We see the power of fellowship. We see cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we see confession of sins. So many times, you know, that has been pushed aside. So now, like, grace has covered it. No, you, where you drop the ball, you confess to God that, God, I'm sorry. Because there's a conscience in you now that is awakened by the blood of Jesus, Right? That conscience tells you, you shouldn't have spoken to that brother that way. You shouldn't have done that. And then you say, Father, I am sorry. And he cleanses us and he forgives us. Praise the Lord. And then the last one I wrote here is confession for the renewal of your mind. Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, it says that in from verse 8. But now you yourself are to put off all this anger. Wrath, malice, blaspheming, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing you have put off the old man and his deeds. Now put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge. He said put on the new man. Put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him. Who created him? Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or slave or free, but Christ is all in all. Put on the new man. So next week we'll continue the rest of Romans. As we as we pray right now, I just wanted to ask that the Holy Spirit teach you to put on the new man that we are no longer slave to sin hallelujah let's yield our members unto righteousness hallelujah let's yield to him hallelujah in Christ we overcome. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. He said, put on the new man. Lord, we, we, we yield to your word today that you teach us to grow in you. Continue to manifest your glory. Continue to manifest your power. We know that we, we are no longer slave to sin because we belong to you. In you, we have overcome. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.